All right, I want to share, uh, see I kind of skipped that part because I'm, I'm kind of excited to share uh, a few testimonies that have come in uh, lately. And uh, how many love to hear a testimony? I love to hear testimonies. So I just want to share a couple with you of how uh, you, partnering with us, are making an impact. Uh, and so if, if, if I may, I'm just going to read a couple, and then we actually have a couple people that are uh, that are online, I believe. Matt, are, are we getting got, we're getting good? okay? That are we're going to share a little bit. But this one comes from Canada, Alberta, Canada. Any Canadians in here? We have a couple of Canadians, Canadian transplants, anyway. Uh, this comes from Sandy in Canada. She says, "Hi Jim, I started watching your teachings a few months ago and have been so blessed by them. Thank you for keeping it so simple." I wasn't sure what she meant by that, but. Anyway, uh, it's so beautiful and so exciting. I live in a very traditional Mennonite community where change is not easily accepted. I have been keeping the Sabbath for about six months now after spending a couple years trying to prove my parents wrong on this very subject. But God has revealed his truth to me regarding the, uh, the Sabbath. So with the Mennonite community and the Torah starting to impact uh, this community, how exciting is that? So, but God has revealed his truth to me regarding the Sabbath in a very dramatic way, I might add but he has not revealed it to my husband yet. There are a few other people who have been stirred by the Holy Spirit in my community in the last few years and have become Torah keepers. But among these believers, mostly are women whose husbands refuse to even look into what their wives believe, including my own husband. I'm thankful for what God has revealed to me, but but I I wish that he has shown this to my husband first. When, listen to this, when will husbands be the spiritual leaders of their homes? And, uh, and she goes on to share uh, about how she says, I know I cannot serve two gods. I know all things are possible with God. And I pray uh, that His truth will, reveal, will be revealed to Him and our entire community. We would really appreciate your prayers and encouragement. So would you please pray, for those of you that pricked your heart, for Sandy in Canada. She's in a Mennonite community. She wants the men of her community to begin to uh, latch a hold of this truth. So, you know, truth doesn't know any boundaries. It doesn't know color, race. It doesn't know language. It goes right into every place. Anybody that has a spirit of Yahweh, uh, they will download that eventually the His Spirit will move into that direction. This comes from uh, San Diego. I believe it says, Hello, PFT. I wanted to take a moment to share how much your ministry means to me. I want to thank every single person on your staff for all your hard work you do in the kingdom. I want you to know that all your hard work by making this ministry available online has changed my life forever, all capitals. I encourage you to upload every single message video possible for all to watch, especially me. I've learned more from watching one of PFT messages than my entire life in church. Thank you for continuing to do exactly what the Father says and when He says, because we as, quote, Christians need tough love from the Father. I've rid my home of every unclean DVD collection, clothing, and miscellaneous items, starting celebrating the, the, the feast, Shabbat, and still learning the do's and don'ts of Yahweh's word. The Lord is good. Every one of your videos has brought an understanding of the Bible that creates foundation and a thirst to worship my creator in truth and spirit. Amen? That was a cool one. And one more here uh, before we go to Kelly online. It says, this is from uh, Anna from Australia, Western Australia, and she says, she says, my comment is on the PFT financial report, the vision cast. I want to thank you for this podcast for explaining the vision of Passion for Truth Ministries. I'll be making regular donations when I can as I have been so touched and blessed by your teachings. I thank our Elohim for giving you, uh, I guess she's talking to you, Jim Staley and your ministry, the blessing to reach so many people across the world. I watch your podcast every week, and I and my fellow friends have bought many of your teachings and uh, and since given them to many people, not just in Australia, but in Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and many other Pacific nations. Many blessings to all of you at Passion for Truth Ministries. Shalom. How cool is that? His word is moving around the world. Well, without further ado, I think we're ready to go. Kevin, are you there? I am, Jim. You turn him up Shabbat a little Shabbat shalom, Jim. Shabbat, Shabbat shalom, Mishpaka. I just wanted to give a short testimony or about how passion for truth has affected the life of me and my family. Um, 
we actually discovered Passion for Truth through a, a family member who had found you online uh, about a year ago, and uh, we began to watch and and was just amazed by the by the how how we felt so connected to a congregation that was 350 miles away, and I we don't have that here as much as we'd love to. That's just not it's something that's not in this area, and I. Um, we had decided that we were going to come and, and, and spend a weekend and fellowship and worship there and um, had, had made plans and made plans and then had changed those plans. But and we were in prayer one night and, um, and the Ruach Hokadesh laid on my spirit that that was the weekend for us to go. So I told Bridget to, um, to pack the bags and book a room where we were going to St. Louis. And I'd gone the Friday night before, or the Friday afternoon, and filled up the tanks. And as we left on our trip uh, Saturday morning, uh, the trip computer said 317 miles till empty, and uh, the GPS said 366 miles. And we were uh, concerned about having to stop and buy gas on Shabbat, but Yahweh made a way, and we drove 388 miles with 317 miles worth of gas. And uh, just the the ability to be there and and to be a part of it, even for one service, was something that that has changed our lives forever. And um, we, on the way home, we just we were amazed that that we felt so at home with a with a congregation that we'd never met before, with a group of people we'd never met before. That it was uh, it, we didn't meet a stranger. Everyone was incredibly friendly, um, and it was like we'd known each of you our whole lives. Just a, an incredible sense of, of welcomeness and, and, and true mishpaka. And um, don't, don't ever take that for granted, because I think I probably speak for everyone that watches online that we would love to have what you have. Thank you very much, Kevin. He is from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and I met him just a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I just felt from the Father that um, I needed to take a few minutes and share some of these things with you because I get these every day. Matt comes into my office almost daily with a stack of mail and cards and thank you letters and, and, and testimonies. And um, sometimes I feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed in, in, one, in one way. Uh, because the Father has really used this ministry to change people's lives. Uh, but the Father has said, no, your family needs to know what they're a part of. And, uh, and so, uh, do we have Rodney uh, ready to go? Rodney is from Dallas, Texas. Hello, hello. This is Rodney Mallard. I'm from Dallas, or Grand Prairie, Texas, suburb of Dallas. And I uh, just wanted to let you know how Passion for Truth Ministries has uh, impacted mine and my family's life. Uh, actually, a friend of mine gave me a, uh, a DVD of, of Jim teaching on uh, the identity crisis uh, a year ago, actually, this month. And he gave it to me. That he's been a close friend of mine for years, but I was like, you know, nah, I just don't want to see that because I know it's going to be kind of different. But it sat in front of my TV for about six weeks, and then I always saw it every time I turned the TV on. So one day my wife and I watched it. And it changed my world because it made me understand who I am and what this whole biblical life is all about. So then we watched Truth or Tradition, and I have to be honest with you, I was totally annoyed with that video because it's like, hey, my favorite holiday and everyone's favorite holiday, you know, is totally an upside down situation. But I had my children, my two daughters and my two sons, my two sons didn't watch it, but my two daughters and my wife and I watched it. And this was literally the month before Christmas. So this was in thanks this was about a week before Thanksgiving. And so after we watched it, I sat there and I was like, Well, I'm not gonna force this on my children. But I asked my wife and I asked my daughters, I said, Are we going to have Christmas? <laughs> and my daughters both looked at me and they said, Absolutely not, we can't have Christmas. You saw what we just learned. So it was very tough, but at the same time we understood 
you know, that we've always known we were, we were set apart. We were called out to be different. Uh, we were kadosh, I guess, if you want to call it that. But it was never easy and understandable why. Now we understand why. And we started learning then. So it was tough because we didn't do it at all here in my home. But we still ended up having a little Christmas over at my parents' house. But even they knew something was different. And uh, now we don't do it at all. And everybody in my family over this past year has come to a point where, uh, you know, they've all checked it out. The first six months, they just thought, you know, y'all are weird. You know, they're, they're Christians. Everybody in my family is Christians. But they just thought we were kind of weird because I've always believed there was more. Even my own brother, you know, probably one of the most spiritual guys I know, he's like, Rodney, why are you always searching? Why can you not be content in what the Lord has brought to you? And I'm like, because to me, I always knew there was something more. It couldn't be just this simplistic uh, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, charismatic Christian belief system that all I got to do is believe in that it was that simple and to go on. I always knew there had to be more. So after I watched the second video of Truth or Tradition, uh, I ended up, uh, a friend of mine, Monty, was uh, the worship leader of the church I was going to, and I was telling him about this, and he's like, hey, man, I, uh, I, got, I know how to get in touch with Jim if you want to find out more about his ministry. So he put me in touch with him, and I ended up buying everything that Jim's ever preached since he started preaching. And so every message Jim's ever preached since uh, I assumed he started preaching, recording them, I have downloaded to my phone, and the kind of business that I have allows me to work and listen to things or do whatever, you know, music or whatever on my phone. So I I listen to about six hours a day of all the things that Jim records, and a lot of times, I mean, uh, I have to listen to them. I, well, I've listened to every one of his messages at least 50 times a piece, but it, I still get new things from it because there's so much there, and the nice thing about it is it it's become very easy for me to speak to people now about why I believe what I believe and how things are different. But at the same time, it becomes controversial to people because when people don't understand, uh, all they think of is that you're weird. And I'm sure, you know, people that have come into this uh, light, if you want to call it that, the light of this message or this word, they understand that it all of a sudden it sets you apart. If you're going to if you're going to believe it, but it's now starting to uh, not only affect my family's life for the better, but people are starting to see it, and I'm very pleased and happy about that. At the same time, my my older brother, the one I was telling y'all earlier that was very spiritual, I, I gave him the identity crisis, and him and his pastor watched it. Uh, this was about eight months ago. And they were, uh, you know, they weren't sure. You know, it, it's a little different than what they're, well, it's totally different than anything that you watch. But I believe it's the most important message that anyone can watch because it makes them understand who they are. So I started, I wanted to give them to him in order. And he's like, okay, he came over uh, the week later after he watched it. And he goes, you know, he's not sure, but he's going to check more into it. And then I said, hey, I want you to watch this one here called Ain't He Rested which is the Sabbath video. And he's like, hey, look, we sat down and talked for like four hours. And he's like, hey, look, I don't know that I'm going to watch this or when I'm going to watch this, but uh, don't push me on it. Don't push me on it. If I like it, I'll move forward. If I don't like it, I won't. And uh, he kept it for about eight weeks. And, I, and I'd call him once a week just to see if he watched it. And so finally, about the ninth week, I went over and picked it up and brought it back so I could have some other people watch it. But then Memorial Day came. And uh, my entire family, my sister, my brother, my parents, my other brother, and all everybody in the family came over for Memorial Day. And um, so I pull out and I ask a few people that were here, I'm like, hey, would y'all like to learn about what I'm learning? And, you know, most of them don't really, a, a lot of the people that were here weren't necessarily family. So they're like, sure, we'll watch a video with you. So I pulled out and he rested, which is the Sabbath video. And uh, my brother, <laughs> it's funny because my brother comes in and he's looking over and he walks over to his wife because he knew what I was doing. And he walks over to his wife uh, and he goes, hey, let's go right now. And she goes, no, you're going to sit down and watch this video. He goes, no, I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to watch it. And and she says, you're watching it. So she made him sit down. And all of my brothers and sisters were in here and we watched it. But what's funny is my brother sat down and watched it. And I never, I never could look at him, and he would look over at me from the other side of the room, and I had to do my best 
not to look over at him and smile because I, you know, it was basically it was a, a contest. Little brother's not going to have me watch a video when I don't want to, but I did uh, not look at him at all. And at the end of the night, we had a, a eight hour conversation with all of, all of my family that night out on the back porch, and uh, they started getting it. They couldn't argue it. Now, it's changing the people around me the most. And, and I say that because, to me, I don't have lots of friends, mostly because of the way that I am. You know, I like to talk about godly things, and the average world person doesn't want to talk about godly things. They just want to talk about whatever. So my brother-in-law got it, and then the next day is when we had the, the big get-together for everybody. My brother got it. My uh, Here, just the past few months, I'm sorry, the past few weeks, my mom finally started getting it. And uh, the people that I care most about are the people that I wanted to share it with the most. So, you know, I've made a long story. There's so many more I could give. But the fathers, uh, we finally prayed last week after the message last week, the Sabbath service. My wife and I prayed, and we were just like, Father, please just bring people that I can share this stuff with because I, got, I'm, I can't force it on people any longer. But I want everyone to know that the fact that there is a ministry there, the fact that, the, that you know, the Father put Jim where he's at, you know, it does, it, it, it's changing lives. It's changed mine. If it changed no one else's, it changed mine. It's changing people because I hear it from others that I've got people all over the country now watching his videos. So, Jim, I may have taken a little longer than I probably should have, but I do appreciate you, you know, giving me the opportunity to share um, you know, what we've learned and how what you teach has changed our world for the much better. And oh, by the way, we're going to be doing a, we're going to be doing, uh, we're building a sukkah uh, this week for Sukkot. We really don't know what we're building yet. We're trying to figure it all out still, but, <laughs> you know, it's all exciting. You know, we're doing, we're, we're trying to do, I like the term that you use. We are going to be doing Bible things in Bible ways. It isn't so, and no longer is it going to be Baptist things or charismatic things or Pentecostal things. We want to do Bible things in Bible ways. If it offends others, you know, I, I can't apologize for that because all we're trying to do is what God wanted us to do, and that's where we are now. So, Jim, thank you very much for the opportunity just to get to, to learn the truth and to share our testimony with you. You know, this is the kind of stuff that, that's happening all over the world and uh, all over the country. And this is the conversations that I get to have with people is, is he always changing my life? He's changing my life. And over and over again, and I, and I feel so bad because I don't normally do this, but they say, you've got to tell your people. It's changing our lives. We're out here by ourselves. We're behind a tree in South Dakota in the middle of the desert. And, and we've got one little TV and 22 people are, 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 are hugged around it. You know, watching every single week. We have over a dozen churches across the country that are streaming right now live. So if that's you out there, we want to say hello to you. And uh, so this is making a difference. His Word is making a difference. So I told you that tonight might be a little bit different, and so I can see kind of the direction that the Father is going. And, um, and so we're just going to flow in that because we, it, it doesn't look like going to get to my message, uh, which I'm, I'm kind of bummed out about that because um, the Feast of Tabernacles was going to be the message I was going to teach on uh, as part of our Fall Feast Days message, and I'm very excited about teaching on it. Um, I've, I've, the Lord showed me some pretty amazing things uh, that deal with that. So um, it's not my timing. I would much rather uh, do it now before the Feast of Sukkot, and, uh, but it, if I start, we will be here another three-hour service. So, um, but I guess what's really uh, in this continued in this vein, so that you guys can just see uh, a, a real face, a real person that has uh, made uh, that, that that the Father is making a difference in in her life. I would like to introduce to you a new friend of mine, and uh, I don't even remember her last name. Uh, but her name is Brittany, and she is from uh, Panama. And uh, her parents are here with her this evening. Come on up. You can find your way. Uh, come on this side. Yeah, that's a good idea. And she is going to give a testimony here on her journey and how it's connected to PFT, and I think you're going to be very blessed. 
okay? So please give Brittany a warm applause from Panama. Well, I want to say thank you to Jim for inviting me to come and, and share another testimony with you guys. Um, just as we are commanded to keep the commandments, we are also uh, told to remember his testimonies and to speak of them because it gives glory and praise to our Father in heaven. Um, 2002, I was a sophomore in college, and uh, we were uh, just starting the semester. It was August. And I got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning from a friend of mine, and he was saying, hey, you want to go to Kansas City with us? I was going to Southwest Baptist University, which is in Bolivar, Missouri. Uh, it's in uh, southern Missouri. And um, so Kansas City was about three and a half hours away. He picked, um, he picked me up as well as another girl who was in my same dorm, and, and then her boyfriend was with us. So in the car, we were in an 87 Bronco, a real old-fashioned style car. It was August, so we had the top off the car, you know, get a nice breeze at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was very cold. Uh, we were driving down the road, and my friend Todd was driving. I was in the passenger seat, and my friends um, Ke Kelly and Ben were in the back seat behind us. As we were driving along, we had just passed Clinton, Clinton Missouri, and something malfunctioned in the car. The Bronco ran off the right side of the highway, and... As it went off the highway into the ditch, Todd um, corrected the car so that we would go back on the highway, but instead of going on the highway, we went straight across the highway towards the median. And he overcorrected again, and the car um, caught the grass that was on the, you know, the grass that we're headed towards, and the back tire um, had a lot of friction with it and caused the car to roll, and we, it rolled probably four to six times, the estimate. Now, Ben, who was in the back seat, was not wearing his seatbelt because um, he was cuddling with his girlfriend at 7 o'clock in the morning, and so he was ejected from the car immediately. He landed um, right where the median meets the asphalt and had severe brain damage um, and uh, was um, taken off life support later that night. Kelly, who was in the back seat, decided to pull her seatbelt really tight so that the same thing would not happen to her. And because of that, her pelvis was shattered, and she was um, restricted to bed rest for about um, two months or so. My friend Todd, who was in the, the, in the driver's seat, um, had probably the, the least amount of injury to his body. He had some damage to his knee, which required some surgery. But other than that, um, both he and Kelly were still conscious after the... Um, the whole accident had stopped. Now, myself, on the other hand, um, something happened with me, and for some reason, I was also ejected from the car. I flew probably 150 feet from where the car had started rolling, and I landed in the middle of the median. Um, there were cars that, you know, that were passing on the highway at that time, and they started stopping, you know, to see if they could help. Obviously, they saw a couple bodies on the ground and a car that was now seriously damaged. One of the men who stopped to help us was an off-duty EMT. The Holy Spirit woke him up that morning about 5 o'clock and told him that he needed to go to Kansas City to a meeting that he had been praying about for weeks. And when he got that message from the Holy Spirit, he wanted to go, but the um, his wife, you know, tried to detain him and keep him home on his day off, but he was insistent and decided to travel up to Kansas City behind us. He was probably within a minute or two minutes of our car, and uh, so when he got to the accident scene, he, you know, did an assessment and saw that I was the one that needed the most help because Ben was already too far gone. No, when he uh, looked at me, he saw that my skin was turning blue because I did not have any oxygen in my body. Now, he, being a paramedic, should come properly equipped for accident scenes such as this, but uh, he called out to the other people, uh, the other bystanders who were there, and asked them if anybody had a breather bag. Now, one man who had no medical affiliation whatsoever ran to his car and produced a breather bag. And I know that that man was an angel because the Father provides what is needed at the right time. They... Uh, um, the ground where I was laying was fairly soft, and so they were able to dig a hole out from underneath my mouth and get the breather bag to my face. 
and get some oxygen into my body. Uh, shortly thereafter, the amb ambulance arrived at the scene, but the ambulance was um, being managed by two women who were just volunteers, and they didn't know how to assemble any of the equipment. Because the paramedic was there, he was able to uh, um, attach the oxygen tank to the mask and get some oxygen in my body and, and also help Ben in his situation. They took us back to Clinton and then life lighted us to Kansas City to separate hospitals. And about that time, um, it was Saturday morning, my parents were running late to Sabbath services once again, and the phone started ringing. And it's one of those situations, oh, do we answer, do we not, do, oh, do we answer? Yeah, well, okay, hello? This is Research Medical Hospital. We're calling to let you know that your daughter, Brittany Wilhelm, is, um, has been in a serious car accident and you need to get here immediately. Uh, they froze and uh, they wouldn't give my parents any information about my, my condition. But my mom asked them one question, and she said, does she have a head injury? And the lady didn't answer. They packed their bags. Um, my, my brother was home from college that weekend, and my sister was there. So they, they all packed their suitcases and headed on up to Kansas City three and a half hours while thinking and praying about everything that they um, were now involved in. They stopped at uh, the Shabbat service and said some prayers over me with the pastor and the congregation. Now, at that time, the service was being taped on video, kind of like this, and uh, the videos were being sent to Africa. And because my story, um, my prayer request came before the congregation, and the pastor was able to put that on the video so that the people in Africa and also the missionary over in Israel would be praying for me and in my condition. Now, that's the beginning of the prayer chain and the power of prayer. When my parents got up to the hospital three and a half hours later, they were met at the door by the chaplain, which is not the first person they wanted to see. But uh, the chaplain you know, tried to console them and, and calm their, their stresses. After they prayed for me in the chapel, um, they went to the emergency room where I was. And uh, I was in surgery because they, the window, the passenger side window, had completely cut open my whole face and my ear and down my neck and um, so they were doing plastic surgery on my face right here. The doctors let my parents know of my condition and they said, well, you know, we have some broken bones. She's broken her, her right arm, she's broken her, her clavicle, a couple ribs broken, but the most important one is that um, she's broken some vertebrae in her back. And my parents said, do whatever it takes, just save her. And they said, okay, we're going to take her into surgery. And uh, when they came out of surgery eight hours later, they had put two titanium rods in my back with screws about this big. And they told my parents that they had never seen a case that bad, that um, it was very serious, that the bones that were shattered in my back were about one to two millimeters from my spinal cord, and they weren't sure if they got them all out. And my, they told my parents that, uh, that I would never walk again. And my parents said no that the God, of, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God who heals. And because of the power of prayer, I am still walking today, and I give him all the glory. <laughs> now, um, I was on some, some serious uh, painkillers, like some morphine, and uh, telling some really crazy stories, making people laugh in the hospital, which was to alleviate the stress and the, and the sadness. Uh, about a week later, you know, the doctors were watching my condition, and, um, and I started moving my legs. And the doctors looked at them and said, no way, this is impossible. And my parents said, yes, this is possible. <laughs> um, when I was laying there, I was in and out of sleep a lot. And one day, my mom was standing over my bed with another girlfriend of mine. And uh, they were standing there, and I woke up from my sleep, and I looked at my mom, and I said, Satan was there. And I fell back asleep. And my mom said, what? Brittany, what'd you say? Hello, can you repeat that? And um, after, after the accident happened, um, she remembered, she had a dream uh, about uh, five or six years before the accident. And in this dream, she saw a box-type vehicle, kind of like a Bronco would be. And she saw me laying on the ground. And she knew in her dream that I was supposed to be dead. After the accident happened, um, several months later, she had that same dream, and she saw the same vehicle, and she saw me on the ground, and she knew in her dream that I was supposed to be dead. 
Satan wanted my life, but the Father did not let him take it. And it was the power of prayer. Now, um, the doctors told my parents that I would be in the hospital for four to six weeks, and I was out in two weeks. I went to rehab, and that's where my, my memory comes back. I remember being in that rehab hospital and looking at those patients and saying, my life is not here. These people have been here for six, eight months, and they're still here and not progressing. I'm, I'm not staying here. They told my parents four to six weeks, and I was out in two weeks. But when I went home, uh, it was really the time for the Father to work on me. I did a lot of self-introspection and spent a lot of time um, reading and, and praying and getting closer to the Father because that's, that's what I needed to do now taking the semester off of college. The Father showed me at that time that uh, the reason why my back was broken was because before that, my support system was in myself. He needed to break my back in order to rebuild my support system in him. I had to depend on my mom for a lot of things, including washing my hair, including sitting up in the morning, which is when I woke up from, from sleeping. It was a very humbling time, and it was a time to realize that we need each other, that we, don't, we can't live life independently. We can't live without each other. We, we need this family. We need this community, and, and it's the love that builds us up. Um, it was, a, it was a, a very difficult time, but, um, but it was a time that changed my life. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a, a man here who gave a message. His name was Matthew Nolan, and he gave an amazing message about the body of Messiah and went into the bones and the 28 support bones around the, the five vital organs. And it was in that message that I learned um, that the Father broke my back and what bone that, that uh, represented. I uh, had been called to missionary work, and um, it wasn't until after this accident that I realized, again, what my purpose was in life, because up until that time, I was just going and doing like normal, but without purpose. After my accident, I went on several mission trips, um, one of them being to Panama, and when I got there, the Father put a fire in my heart for those people, just a, a passion in, in my heart to teach them the truth of the scriptures and to, to reach that country with, um, with his light and with his spirit. It wasn't until several years later that I went back to Panama and uh, um, you know, was more involved in, in missionary work, more involved in, um, in some people, with some people there. And so this year, um, yeah, I've completely dedicated myself to what the Father has um, for Panama and his purpose and his, um, his mission and his ministry being planted there in Panama. As of just uh, a couple months ago, my parents were there and they met um, the plumber, who happens to be a Sabbath keeper, and by introducing to him some awesome truths about the feast and about the name, the Hebrew names, he took those back to his congregation, and therefore, through a course of events, was expelled from his congregation because of these. And so he um, and his family was the first to start our home Torah study. And it's, uh, it's awesome because the Father is, um, is using passion for truth to speak through me uh, to the Panamanians. And it, um, when I hear Jim's messages, I turn them around in Spanish and try to teach you know, the best I can on, on their level of spiritual intelligence. And it's, um, it's really neat to see the way the Father is using this ministry right here to reach people like me down in little tiny Panama, which is smaller than the state of Tennessee, but uh, that the Torah group is starting there. And I have a vision that, that next year, but by the end of next year, we'll have um, several different Torah groups and um, Torah churches, the assemblies down there in Panama. And it's, um, it's just a matter of, of progressing and continuing in the work of the Lord. If I may, um, I want to speak to the Spanish audience that is listening on camera right now. Um, ahora les voy a hablar a ustedes, mis hermanos que hablan español, porque ustedes también son parte de la Casa de Israel, que su identidad, igual que la nuestra, 
este, formado en ser parte de, de esta casa de Israel, la que fue desprezada en todo el mundo y ahora um, está reconociéndose en el, uh, en el plan de Dios. Quiero leerles de Isaías, está en capítulo 43, dice... Porque yo, Yahweh, Dios tuyo, santo de Israel, soy tu salvador. A Egipto he dado por tu rescate, a Etiopía y a Seba por ti. Porque a mis ojos fuiste de gran estima, fuiste honorable, y yo te amé. Daré, pues, hombres por ti y naciones por tu vida. No temas, porque yo estoy contigo. Del oriente traeré tu generación, y del occidente te recogeré. Diré al norte, da acá, y al sur, no detengas. Trae de, lo, de lejos mis hijos y mis hijas de los confines de la tierra. Todos los llamados de mi nombre para gloria mía los he creado y los formé y los hice. Que ustedes um, son parte de nuestra familia y ahora muy pronto les va a llegar el mensaje Um, la verdad del mensaje hebreo que trajo Yeshua Jesús. Um, I just want to say thank you to, to this family here for, for bringing so much love. And thank you for Jim uh, for opening this door of ministry, Brittany, um, especially to Latin America. Tell us a story about the bus. Uh, just this last week, um, I was on the bus. It was Monday, and we had torrential downpours in Panama so bad that uh, it actually took out, um, I, th I think the last count was three bridges. And one of the bridges was um, a, a main uh, bridge, you know, that passes between two, um, two main cities, b between, actually they're named David after King David and Concepcion, which is the word conception in Spanish. Now you can make that connection if you want to, that the bridge was taken out between David and the Concepcion. Um, so I was on the bus and I had to take the bus around the, the long way to get to Concepcion because my house um, was really close to Concepcion. However, I didn't know that the bridge was taken out between Concepcion and my house. They didn't tell me that until after I got off the bus an hour and a half later. And, um, however, being on the wrong bus that night, I was able to, uh, to talk to this girl who was sitting next to me across the aisle. And she talked to me in English, which surprised me because it doesn't happen very often. But she told me she's an English teacher and she asked me what I do. And I said, well, I'm a missionary. And she said, really? She was, she was really excited about that, which normal people mm. aren't excited about meeting a missionary. And, uh, she said, well, what church do you go to? Because that's a really big question in Panama. I said, well, I... Um, I don't go to church, but I kind of work with this organization. It's called Passion for Truth. And her eyes lit up, and she said, really? And I think it was that word truth, you know, that ring a bell in her. And I said, well, what church do you go to? And she said, no, I don't go to church. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. She, the way she reacted, she doesn't even go to church. And I said, well, do you read the Bible? And she said, yes, every day. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and uh, she looked at me, and she said, I want you to teach me the Bible. I said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow on vacation. I'll be back in a month. Um, when, you know, we'll keep in contact by email, and I'll call you when I get back. And she's like, no, no, more than learning English, I need you to teach me the Bible. And I said, wow, this is awesome. She said it two or three times. And I thought, wow, this, um, this is the spirit. I wasn't supposed to be on that bus. It didn't go by my house. But I met this girl who now wants to be a part of our Torah study. And uh, so, you know, we're starting small. We're starting, we're less than 10 people, but... It, that's where it starts. And so thanks to Passion for Truth that's um, being able to feed me down in Central America. And that it, we're also feeding others, especially Panamanians. Wow. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so when she got to that part of the story for me, you know, it just stuck out to me because I didn't even know we had a Panamanian missionary. <laughs> But now we have a missionary from to Panama. <laughs> so we want, to, uh, we want to support you in any way that we possibly can. Uh, we will get your address. We will flood you with resources. Um, if we need to 
uh, and I know I can speak for the entire congregation that if we need to take a collection and purchase a projector and, and something that y- your people can, can get together and, and have a weekly study and, and be a part of the, the family here every week, whatever it takes, we, we want to help you. And to, can, am I doing okay? Uh, you agree with me here? We want to support them. And um, so if you're online and you would like to uh, take an offering uh, for our missionary, your missionary, to Panama and begin to seed, as you have seeded into this ministry, this is what's happening. And, uh, and how many more across the country and across the world that have not even contacted us yet, that they, are, uh, they consider this their, their mishpaka, and they are spreading the truth like wildfire. And so um, I give you my word, over the next year you are going to see uh, scores of these things happening. And so um, can we pray for her right now? Let's do that. Father, we just pray for Brittany and uh, her heart. Father, thank you for saving her. Thank you for keeping an eye on her and watching over her. It is clear that you have sent your guardian angels to watch over her, that you have a calling on her life to begin something new and uh, to bring back the ancient truths of your word to your people in, uh, in Central America. And so, Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of, of beginning a friendship with her and a partnership in ministry We thank you for bringing her to be part of our staff and our extension of our staff here at PFT. And Lord, we just pray for the people in Panama right now that when she goes home, she would have supernatural contacts, supernatural networking, Father, that you would put her in front of leaders and those of unbelievable influence. And Father, we ask that you would bring pastors and leaders and those aside her, Lord, to assist her and to help her, that you would bring uh, the, the, the Jonathans, Father, you'd raise up the Davids in South America and Central America, and, and Father, that we would begin to be used as an extension of your arm to push your truth into the uttermost parts of the world, the four corners, I should say, Father, which your sheep have been scattered. We ask that you'd begin to draw them home. Father, you've brought someone that speaks uh, fluent Spanish. We ask that you would use that tongue uh, to minister to those Uh, in every area of Brittany's life. Thank you for anointing and blessing her. We ask for supernatural revelation and testimony. Until next time, in Yeshua's name, amen. 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 Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. I don't know about you, but that's what it's all about. It's uh, the best message that, that, that we could hear is his message going out. So I don't know what else to do but to ask... Is there anyone else uh, that would like, that is feeling a burning desire to share a testimony? Uh, Maybe you are from out of town, so let's give our out of town guests uh, an opportunity here. Um, Is there anyone that that would like to share a testimony? Yes, sir. Come on up. How are you doing? Jim, I'm Jet Krause from Heron, Illinois. It's my pleasure to be here. My wife and I experienced the pleasure of being here. And during our 30th anniversary this summer, we got away for a weekend and came up here because we wanted to find more. (laughs) We have seven children. We're a homeschool family. And and I'd like to give testimony about that because I feel like there's a lot of people out there that know a little bit. And somewhere around 2001 or two, somewhere in there, we went to a Passover as a homeschool family that was put on four homeschool families. My wife and I walked out of there going, who is this Hebrew Jesus? We have to take a closer look. And my wife being a wife, not just that, but a researcher, and and we learned that, that the women, it seems, do focus on God better than the men, and we have to be dragged along. And I pray that I will be the spiritual leader of my family now, as as I have tried lately. But I was uh, always grew up in a mainstream Baptist church and was a minister, lay minister of music, and uh, did everything everywhere musically. And about 1996, I said, uh, or 2006, 
I said, whatever, Lord, finally. And I'd known since I was 10 years old that I was supposed to have made that statement to God. And, and I ended up be getting paid positions as minister of music. And through this time, I had met my friend Vernon, who's a Messianic Jewish fellow, and he had introduced me to the music uh, of Paul Wilbur and of Jonathan Settle and on, of different uh, Israeli and musicians, and it, it had become the music of my heart. And just a couple of years later, about four years ago, I met uh, Rabbi Moshe Lori, moved to Southern Illinois of spiritual warfare. He's an um, Israeli, Hebrew, Mossad, uh, Messianic um, rabbi. And I, my, Vernon, my friend Vernon introduced me, and I told my wife, we've got to go. And she said, it's, it was December, which we'd grown to really kind of dislike December at that point. <laughs> And it's a very busy time. I said, yes, but these are people that actually believe and see the world the way we do. And so we went, and it was a, we had had fellowship. We had had Passover with this group two years earlier. It was a loose-knit group of Messianic Jewish people, about 18 Jews, Jewish folks in Marion, Illinois area, uh, that believed in Jesus, and they had a Christian church that allowed them to meet on Friday nights, and uh, and the first time I walked in, I said, they're just as dysfunctional as any Baptist church I've ever been in. I think I can get along here. And, yeah. And so uh, we went, and the, uh, the gentleman who had led this fellowship, I had actually worked on him in the hospital and sent him for open-heart surgery. And he had contacted the, the uh, rabbi and asked if the rabbi would take over this group of believers and, uh, and I happened to be there at that time, the way God works things. And uh, they had no one doing music. And the rabbi said, well, uh, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're not just going to have a fellowship. We're going to make it a congregation. We're going to do it legally and, and get a board. And, we're gonna, and, and we just jumped right on board. And, and uh, we stepped in. And, and I said, you don't do any music. I've been learning this music that my friend gave me here for about three years, and I've got about 60 songs in the top of my head. I'd like to lead music for this. And, and so I ended up leading music on Friday nights with a Messianic Jewish congregation. And, and about three months later, I'm doing, still doing Sunday church, and it was the time of the 60th anniversary of Israel. And the Sunday church that I was with, I invited them to go to Carbondale, Illinois, to the, to the synagogue there because they were having a celebration. They were inviting everybody of Illinois. And uh, the congregation I was with invited me not to speak anymore, just sing. Sad but true. I have come to where truth means more than tradition. Mm in my life. Thank you, brother. Two years ago, we started meeting on Saturdays with my family, and we started by looking through the 155 verses in Scripture that use the word Sabbath. And we started meeting with my children. I have seven children. One of them got married this year. She doesn't agree with us. We're praying for her. We've learned this week an atonement I ask the question, what, what is the messianic significance? What is the significance for us who have had our sins atoned for? And, and it made me realize that God set this up, that we're supposed to do it annually. Do you all do the Ahet prayer? Mm -hmm. What a humbling thing. If you are watching right now and you didn't, please watch last night's service or Friday night service so you can understand the Ahet prayer. To me, it explains why Christians need to do Yom Kippur so that they will be reminded to set aside their prideful ways and be reminded that we need atonement even though we already have it. Mm -hmm. God tells us to remember mm -hmm every year that we need it and that he provides it and that he is our provision. And uh, this year I did, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I, I, 
this year, they, last night, they labeled me Chazan. And, and I don't, you know, I, I, I sing a few things in Hebrew, but I, I can't do anything. I, I can't read Hebrew. I, I, read the, I read it phonetically, and I've taught it, and I'm taught it from my rabbi. Uh, but we do the best that we can, you know, and, and, and I think one step at a time, a little bit at a time, one family in Panama at a time, we can bring people to the truth of Scripture. Amen. Amen. And, and, and it is a journey. When we were here last, a couple come up that had given their resignation to a mainstream Christian church and said that we're going to work with passion for truth. And my wife and I were honored to be here that night when a, when a couple stood up because they're standing for truth when they do that. And uh, Amen. I, I just uh, do appreciate you. I do appreciate both of the videos that were, that were discussed. I think they're very important. And I think that we have a message to share with everyone that, that is very important. Amen. And I thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. You know, I'm starting to see a theme. It's amazing to me because uh, I was talking to my staff today in a board meeting uh, that the Father is putting on my heart heavily over the last few months, and it's been reflected in, in the messages that I've been giving about family and about mishpaka and about being legal. And he used those, all of those same terms that it's time that we get beyond what I call the, the independent Hebrew uh, worshiper, uh, much like an independent contractor. Uh, for some reason, uh, we have had this, this uh, the glass has been shattered to such a degree that, that as Yahweh begins to gather people, they're broken and they're hurt. And, uh, and they're just kind of, you know, at a distance and I'm not really sure what I want to do. I don't mean to, but I'm just, I'm here to learn. I'm going to, you know, here to feed on the buffet, if you will. And the father's saying, no, you don't understand. My family has been broken. I'm not bringing you back together so that you can learn. I'm bringing you back together so that you can be family again. That's what I'm calling you to do, and it, to be in covenant with one another and to have that, that legalese so we can be under His spiritual leadership. Amen. Is there any of you guys would like to give a testimony? Okay. Anybody else would like to give a testimony before we hang it up? Okay, come on up. About you, then you, and then we'll, uh, we'll probably be done. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm from Jonesburg. Uh, it's about an hour down I-70. Um, well, here recently, I've been kind of on a quest for truth and how appropriate I've been led here. Um, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, for a while now, I've been trying to get my parents on the right track. Um, they're kind of like the traditional Baptist Christian and all that. And, uh, you know, for a while, I mean, they've been fighting me tooth, claw, and nail on this um, every inch of the way, but I just keep, you know, carrying on. And... Uh, you know, but I'm very persistent, very, very persistent, and I've been very determined to get them in here uh, ASAP. Well, as the days go on, I keep presenting them scripture and material over and over and planting the seeds, and just out of nowhere today, uh, my mother told me that she's going to be here the 29th, her and my father will be here. Wow. Just out of the blue. Oh, so thank you for everybody that's been praying for me and my family because <laughs> it was clearly answered. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. The Lord is starting to move. You know, I don't know about you, but I cannot tell you how many people I've met that their journey started in 2002 uh, in that area and I know my journey did and uh, it's amazing to see what the Lord is doing Go ahead. hello everybody um, I just have a really awesome praise um, it started back in August I went to my boss and 
I was asking her about getting the feast off, and with everything that's been happening at my work, there's been a ton of cutbacks, and she pretty much told me, well, if you take the feast off, you're going to have to find a new job. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> and I was praying about it, and God was just like, just let it go. And so um, two weeks ago, when Jim was giving the message on, do you walk by faith or do you say you walk by faith, it just like hit me, and I was like, well, I walk by faith. I'm sorry I do it. Monday morning, the following that message, I walked into my boss's office, and um, I literally watched myself take over. And it was so funny because <laughs> I'm sitting here watching myself have a conversation with my boss that I was part of, but I wasn't a part of. And <laughs> literally, I was like, I'm sorry. I know it's not ideal for you, but I have to do what God's leading me to do, and I have to go to feast. And so from October 12th to the 23rd, I'm just not going to be here. And she was literally just stare, sitting there staring at me. And she blinks and she goes, well, I'm not fighting God. And <laughs> um, wow. the, the entire thing, like, I mean, months ago, you know, trying to give to her in advance and everything, she was just giving me this whole fight on it. And then now the last week and a half, God has totally turned the entire thing around and he gets all the praise and the glory for it. And I get to go to feast. It's actually, they're happy and excited about it at work now and what God's going to be doing. One of my friends threw a witness thing now. Um, just yesterday, I handed her a copy of our, well, the introduction that you did on the feast days of the Lord, because she was like, what is this feast? I got to know about this. And so it's been able to be just this total blessing. And I just give him all the praise for it because he worked it all out. And it was just the weirdest fight that I've ever had as far as I was just, okay, I'm losing my job over this. This is going to be great. I get to get back and find a new job after feasting. <laughs> Not only do I get to keep my job, but it's been a great witnessing tool, and I just praise him so much for what he's worked out through that. And it's just amazing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's fantastic. You know, when you walk out in faith, what she did was exactly what the disciples did. Rabbi Yeshua, walking along the, the shores, said, come and follow me. And has anybody ever wondered why? Why would these disciples, who have a job making good money, just up and jump out of the boat and go follow some guy that they never met in their entire life? Why would they do that? So much so, they, lost, they left their jobs, they left their careers, they lost everything that they owned, including their families, because in first century Judaism, if you converted over to anything that your parents didn't like, they had a funeral service for you, and you were, your, your name was blotted out of the family's book of life, and uh, you lost your inheritance. So it was a huge step of faith to walk out. And the reason why they did this for this rabbi that they'd never even met in their life is because the, the, the protocol for following a rabbi was typically the firstborn's responsibility, was to uh, go to the, 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 the young uh, schools that they had for the Jewish boys and the yeshiva and begin to learn uh, the, the Torah and those things, and, and they would not be required to have an apprenticeship or a trade. They were the ones that were to be the priests of the next generation. And so it was a huge honor to be a firstborn among many uh, different uh, honors of having the double portion inheritance and a lot of responsibility went along with that. And whether you liked it or not, your main responsibility was to, was to become a rabbi, to follow a rabbi. And so they would, the, these firstborns and these and children that were very, very gifted would, would go to uh, the, the, the first school, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head now, and if they made that cut, then they would go to the next stage. And if they made that cut, then they would go to the final stage where they would be handpicked and selected by a rabbi to follow them as students of Gamaliel or Hillel or or Shammai, or whatever rabbi was there at the time. So to be called by a rabbi was like literally being called by a senator, a congressman, or your favorite, you know, president of the United States, or whoever, not that that would be probably uh, something really important for you, but if whoever your most favorite person is got a call from that's very popular and celebrity, that's what it was like. So when they had this rabbi walk across the shores of of the Sea of Galilee, and he says, come and follow me, they jumped ship immediately. Do you know why? Because it, there is nothing, they didn't make the cut. They didn't make the cut. 
And Yeshua bypassed the entire system and said, no, 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 you don't understand. The way I'm doing this is I choose those who I know will follow me with their heart. I'm looking for the heart. I'm not looking for the mind. I'm not looking for the intellectual part. I'm looking for those who have a heart to follow me and always will follow me. And those that step out in faith is why he said, when you step out and you give away your life, I will give you a new life. And so what she just did is she is exemplifying, she's putting into practice the message that that you heard several weeks ago on what is faith. And she said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm not just going to say it anymore. I'm going to do this. Let me ask you a question. How many of you out there leading your families would have left your job to keep the Feast of Sukkot? And I'm being real serious. How many of you seriously in this economy would have been willing to basically die, come back knowing that you're not going to have a job, no income, probably lose your house, your car, and everything that you own within 90 days because they say that's about the average time it takes before people start losing everything they have. She was willing to do that, knowing that her boss already, t- it would be one thing if she wasn't sure, but her boss had already said, you're going to lose your job. And she was willing to lose her job. So when she went back, she said, Father, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to leave my nets. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do Bible things and Bible ways, regardless of the consequences, because your word says that you have to take care of me. This is not my problem. And somehow in that conversation that you had with your boss, your boss probably doesn't even know what she said. Because the Ruach came upon her, closed her mouth, and reopened it the other way and said, I'm not going to fight against God. (laughs) And if you go back and ask her, she'd probably say, I don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't have a meeting with you. Because that's what Abba does. Abba takes care of those who follow him that steps out in faith. Amen? Jacob Nieder, I can tell that you want to come up here. So come on up here. The Holy Spirit's telling me. Why was it because I ran up to the front bench? Or something? Gabe, come here. Uh, I, Gabe's really a cool kid. I love Gabe a lot. Uh, yay, Gabe. <laughs> and uh, I knew he probably wouldn't have jumped up on his own. So I, after Mary gave her testimony, I was I'm watching my daughter up in the cry room. And I ran down and said, Gabe, you got to go tell them what happened to you. So I'm going to stand by Gabe so he doesn't feel too awkward. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everybody. I uh, come from a pretty rough past and everything. Okay. And um, a couple, like about a year ago, I came to PFT with a group of guys, and we just had to, like, I don't know, we were not in this at all. And then I church hopped around for a long time, went to every type of church there was. And it was really hard because the more and more I went and seen different stuff, I kept, was, I was pulled more and more back to this. And then I started coming, and I attended, and I finally started getting into it. And this year lately, I've started to really come out of my little box. And I went and talked to my principal the other day, and uh, she sent me to the head principal. And then he sat me down and talked to me and asked me all kinds of questions. I told him that I was probably going to take off school to be going to Sukkot. And he said, he just looked at me for a second. And he just said, you know what, I can't do anything to stop you. I'll make sure you get all your homework and everything. And later after that, he, uh, he told me that he grew up Jewish, too, and he knew what it was. And it was awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. And I've, I've struggled with a lot of doubt here lately and depression. And in Yom Kippur, I just, I was, I was really hurt. I don't know. I... Uh, I just had a lot of doubt in my heart, and as I was sitting there thinking, I had just prayed, and I just asked for an answer or something, that this is where I needed to be, that this is what he wanted for me, and I, uh, I, 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 was, I was ready to cry, and then Vicky, tense here, she came up to me, and we were just talking and joking, and she was like, it took her a while to say what she was going to say, but as it came out, she was like, Gabe, uh, Yahweh gives people spiritual mothers and aunts and she didn't know this but I never really had a mom and she says Gabe I really feel like Yah's given me to be like a mother for you and as we were talking she didn't know how much that blessed me and then Amy and then her friend Vicky came up and they were like all arguing over me and it was like (laughs) it was like 
It was like, Gabe, I'm your father. I can provide tenfold for anything that you could ever want, you know. Even though you haven't had it, I, I'm, I'm it, you know. Amen. And that was no blessing. You know? Amen. That's awesome, man. Our God is in the business of miracles and replenishing with the locusts of Eden. Amen. He has an incredible past, and uh, it is a miracle that he's alive today and here. Uh, you don't realize uh, what it took for him to come up here. It took Jake, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it has taken uh, incredible miracles that have happened in his life over the past year. And I remember the first time that I met him, and, uh, and Gabe will admit he was a mess. And, uh, and, and not too far away from death in any way, shape, or form. In every way, shape, or form. And, and the Father has rescued him because that's what he does. He did that for Brittany. He, he, he rescues those who he wants to rescue that have a mission and a purpose in life. Yes. And uh, so I will end uh, this evening's uh, message <laughs> with this um, encouragement to you. Where do you fit in? Where's your family? If you're watching online, uh, where's your family? We want to invite you to be part of our family. I'm going to be sharing more what that means uh, when we get back from Sukkot of what that means because we have a plan on doing Bible things in Bible ways. This ministry is going to move uh, from the, not necessarily move from, but is going to add on to the teaching ministry a, uh, a mishpachah. We've been talking about Mishpachah, we've been talking about family, but we are going to move into the biblical, legal direction of what a family looks like. And uh, just like you can say your, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend and you want to get married all you want, you can say your family and I love one another, but until there is a legal union, there's, there's no family. And so uh, I'll be sharing more about that in the, in the upcoming weeks, so I want to encourage you, what are you doing? What is your part? What is your... What is your gift? Where do you want to be? Where do you see yourself in the future serving and, 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 uh, and not just sitting but serving in some way, shape, or form, even if it's in the smallest way? Even if it's the widow, like the widow that gave just her might. This is all I have. Take it. I, I know you can, you can use it in whatever way, shape, or form. I can, I, can, I can vacuum or whatever. So we want to thank you for joining us at Passion for Truth. Would you pray with us? Please stand and, and let's pray. And I'm going to focus tonight's prayer on the, all of you that are online tonight that I don't get to hear, I don't get to see, I get to get your emails. I want to encourage you to call our ministry line and share your testimony, a word of encouragement that you have, that maybe you have been encouraged through PFT. And so call that number. It's 888-900-BIBLE. That's 1-888-900-2425. Give us your testimony. We're going to pray for you right now. Father, we just come before you and thank you so much for our local family here, but also our extended family who is lonely, who is by themselves in many cases, who do not have a family, who does not have someone that they can put arms around to eat with, to uh, mishpachah with, to covenant with. Father, we just come before you on behalf of them and we ask that over the next several months that you would create opportunities for them to meet new people, to draw into them friends, people of like minds, uh, Jonathans and Davids and, and uh, relationships, Father, that will forever be cast into stone, the Ruths and Naomi's of the world. Father, we ask for friends and, and family members to be convinced of your truth, that they would turn from their ways and begin to do Bible things in Bible ways. You start new congregations all over this earth, starting in, in home and in huts. Father, we look forward to being used to minister your word throughout your world in whatever capacity that you choose for us to do so. And so, Father, we ask that you would ignite those that have leadership right now in their DNA that they would stand and begin to lead, to start Bible studies, to start home fellowships, begin to branch out extensions of not just PFT, but your word to walk in your ways. 
we anoint and bless all those that have the calling of ministry on their lives, that they would walk out in faith. You would bring them the people to minister to, and you would change their work. Father, thank you for changing me every day, challenging me, drawing me closer, deeper, and walk with you. Increase the spiritual gifts that we have. Teach us how to, to respond to you in a way that is pleasing to you. Father, we bless all of those that are here, all of those that used to be here. We bless all of those that are watching online tonight. In Yeshua's name, and everyone said, amen. All right. You are free to move about the country. Thank you for joining us. Passion for Truth Ministry. Shalom, shalom.